and Tato Cat, welcome to my channel. Today we are playing Asphyxia. The last time we uh, found out that De Quincy assaulted Samantha, and uh, I'm trying to get over that. And now we're finding out that De Quincy had a bit of a troubled path her past herself, and she's kind of telling us about that. That's pretty much where we left off. Alright, let's continue. De Quincy spoke about her past in a detached manner, as though she was relaying the plight of a friend of a friend, but these experiences must have left their mark upon her. How was she able to sound so light and airy? Samantha knew that if she had a similar story to tell, she wouldn't have hesitated to embellish it with grandiose language suited for a sermon. But... How were you able to survive? I got by. I'm standing here right now, aren't I? De Quincy took another drag of her cigarette, which had begun to burn down. She held the smoke inside her lungs for a few seconds before exhaling it in a wispy, ghostly coils that emitted from her pursed lips. After this gesture, she let her cigarette fall to the earth, snuffing it out with a faint light from underneath the heel of her shoe. And like Samantha, De Quincy had remembered to wear shoes. Even De Quincy was more organized than she was. Samantha could scarcely credit it. So this is the uh, non-blue-haired De Quincy. It was cold outside. Like I said, last winter sure was merciless. I managed to find lodgings. I had just enough cash to cover it, but the house I took refuge in was cold and draughty. It was in a state of total disrepair, really. Looking back on it, I don't think it was fit for human habitation. The paper was peeling from the walls, and there was mold growing on the skirting of the board. I must have inhaled all kinds of toxic spores when I curled up in my bed at night and tried to sleep. Try being the key word because lying in that bed felt like growing up under a sheet of snow. The man who rented it to me was nothing short of a crook, I suppose. I should have figured, given he seemed to have two names. On one day, he would refer to himself as Mr. Brown. And... Another as Mr. Brunel. I'm sure he was committing fraud of some sort, though. What he was up to exactly, I have no idea. He wouldn't let me use the house during the day, so I had to wander around outside looking for some way to occupy myself. I was in such dire straits, I even found myself borrowing cigarettes from homeless people. They offered to me, said I. Looked like I needed it more than they did, and I did. I think they must have pitied me, sitting out there in the snow every day and shivering. Time wore on, and my funds began to dwindle, and I knew soon I wouldn't be able to keep staying at Mr. Brown Brunel's. I'd be kicked out. My clothes were getting dirty, and the dye washed out my hair, so it turned brown. I had no idea. What I was going to do. I hated that of calling my mother, but I knew it couldn't go on as I had, filming it in the park where I was on end. I was afraid I didn't have freezing to death. I had to wrestle with my pride and my anxiety. But De Quincy sighed. In the end, I buckled. I didn't have any choice. I had to call my mother. De Quincy smiled sheepishly, pressing the tips of her fingers together. She wasn't very pleased that I'd run away from school, as you might imagine. I was in a lot of trouble. At least, I would have been, but fortunately, I got very sick after my sojourn in London. And I think my mother felt too guilty to punish me. She must have figured I'd been punished enough. I hadn't eaten properly months. All the money I had went to Mr. Brown Brunel and I was so weak I could hardly move. For ages I just lay in bed at home, staring at the ceiling. I had absolutely no motivation. 
I was utterly depressed. I felt I had no future. That nothing would ever again excite me. That I'd be stuck doing whatever it was my mother wanted until I died. Until, that is, a family friend brought me that book. It was a volume of collected poems by various authors, and a few of these poems stood out more vividly than the rest. These were the poems written by a girl my age, a student at St. Mary's. Her poems had more of an impact on me than any of my teachers ever had. They opened up my eyes and my heart too. It wouldn't be an exaggeration to say they pulled me out of my depression. It really did feel like they saved me. These poems... Samantha's hand slackened. She dropped her cigarette, still burning with weak flame, to the ground, which De Quincey crushed for her. She then drew her foot away. Samantha noted the crumpled cigarette, but was still smoking, but just faintly, like a will-o'-wisp. They weren't Lillian's poems, were they? But of course, who else would they be? De Quincey grinned, then prodded Samantha's cheek with her free hand, the one which was not occupied with her second cigarette. Ow! When seeing Samantha push De Quincey away, the other girl seemed not to know her own strength. She was awfully pushy. But that, Samantha supposed, was De Quincey all over. Of course I was referring to Lillian. How many other budding female poets do you know in St. Mary's? Want to have actually managed to get the material published, I mean. You have a fair point. Though, you didn't need to prod me. Sorry, Sam. I couldn't help myself. Your cheeks are very prodable. And she's drooling again. Prodable isn't a word, and I have no idea what you mean by that. She means your cheeks are squishy. I mean, they're so big and round. You have acres of cheeks, literally acres. I don't think you know what the word literally means. They might as well be asking me to abuse them. My cheeks aren't big. You might want to look at your reflection in the mirror, then reconsider. De Quincey tilted and amused, while Samantha sighed. She meant to shoot De Quincey a glare, but she knew it would have been a wasted effort. Samantha had never been good at being cross, not like Lillian. Lillian excelled at being irate, whereas Samantha could only manage childish huffy, and for only a few moments. I don't think my cheats are potable, as you seem to, but even if they are, that doesn't mean you should have done it. De Quincey giggled. I'm sorry, it's all water on the bridge now, right? Don't decide that for me. That's for me to say, not you. I guess. Sorry, Sam. Lillian's poetry, though, it made me feel a lot better when I was at my lowest. It really did help. Lillian's a gifted poet, isn't she? She really is. De Quincey nodded. My hands were slow and clumsy, and I creased some of the pages of that book. Such a shame. I don't like damaging books, though I have no compunctions about damaging my body. As if to prove her point, De Quincey took another drag of her cigarette and exhale. The pale smokes rolled through the air in a delicate shape like a spider web suspending against the starry sky. But eventually, I read Lillian's poems. I read them over and over again. I felt like I'd been enchanted. Her poems were full of passion, crammed with it, in fact. So, she didn't use many fancy words. They really resonated with me in a way no other writing ever has. It really did feel like the writer knew me personally, and that she knew my suffering. Her poems made me want to try harder, to better myself, to, I don't know, keep going, maybe, keep improving, something like that. I know it sounds cliche, but I've never been very good at creative writing. I like reading creative writing, though. Especially writing like Lillian's. Her poems gave me a purpose, finally had a goal. A goal? To what? Samantha's brow for a... Go to St. Mary's and meet Lillian? De Quincey nodded. I wanted Lillian to know just how much she meant to me, and even if I couldn't properly tell her that, 
I at least wanted to see her and speak to her. I was a little anxious at the thought of meeting her, given I'd built her up in my head as an untouchable idol, but I didn't want to balk before I'd make an effort. I would have forgiven myself if I had run away. I asked my mother if she'd let me enroll in St. Mary's, which she found very perplexing. I had never been half so determined about anything else before, not once. All my life, I'd cowered into complying with my mother's wishes, as I didn't have any of my own. Lillian's poems changed that, however. Eventually, my mother acquiesced to my demands. Maybe she was happy I'd finally found a goal for myself. The fact that St. Mary's has a high percentage of students who later go on to attend Oxford or Cambridge may have also had something to do with it. That's how I went up here. All for the sake of meeting Lillian. And in doing so, I also happened to become acquainted with her best friend. You mean me? Of course! De Quincey smiled bashfully. I still had some reservations about approaching Lillian, to tell you the truth, despite being so besotted with her poetry. That's why I figured after some thought I'd be better to approach her after integrating myself among her circle of friends. Oh. Samantha blinked, at least realization dawn. She laughed softly as though privy to a private joke, but her laughter soon faded, lost to the dark of the night in the chill of the breeze. Her brow furrowing, she raised her head, then spoke thus. So, you try to befriend me, not because you're interested in me, but because you wanted me to introduce you to Lillian? In a sense... Yeah. But that's not wholly true. I was curious about you too, Sam. I wanted to know what sort of friend Lillian Wordsworth would associate with. I imagine you two must have some genius she possessed, given you seemed so close. Did you now? Samantha smiled bitterly, her lips twisted from both the cold and her own self derision. I hope I wasn't a disappointment. De Quincey frowned. You weren't a disappointment, not exactly, but... But... Something close to it, am I right? Well... De Quincey cleared her throat. You're worthy of being Lillian's friend, as I expected. You're just as intelligent as she is. And you're fun to talk to. I've got to say, though, when you're not being down on yourself like you have lately... It can be hard to get in a word edgewise when you start to ramble. Oh, right. I'm sorry. Samantha sighed. I know I talk too much from time to time. Lillian's told me as much before. It's a bad habit. I get so wrapped up in my thoughts. I get carried away. That's alright. You don't need to apologize. I've enjoyed our talks in the past. For the most part, at least. I do like you, Sam. Though I've never yearned... Or your approval as I have Lillian's. However, uh, the inevitable however, I expected as much. De Quincey took another drag on her cigarette, perhaps to allow herself a moment to think. She exhaled a lungful of noxious fumes, her lips pursed, then looked at Samantha Askins. Sadly, I'm afraid you and I might be similar to get along. We're both excellent at procrastinating, we're both reckless, both stubborn and most importantly of all. De Quincey's brow furrowed. I like Lillian a lot too. No, like isn't the correct word. De Quincey corrected herself after yet another pause. Lillian is so far above me, I can't content myself with simply liking her. I love her. Uh. Samantha winced. It felt as though her heart was swelling up inside her chest, stopping up her windpipe. It was hard to breathe. Trembling, she held one pale hand to her pale breast. Contrary to the smoldering pain inside her chest, her fingers felt like ice. Samantha ought to have known really how deeply De Quincey's affections for Lillian ran. Her adorer was evident in the way she hung onto Lillian's every word, as though spellbound. Friends didn't regard one another with such unnearing, unwavering respect. Samantha herself 
was a testament to that. I love Lillian, and I know you love her too. Though I believe my reasons for her loving her are different to yours. That was a confusing sentence. Alarm, Samantha said, still shaking. W -w -w what do you mean? I mean, De Quincy frowned. Though I love Lillian's poems, and I love her intellect, and I love her character, I don't know if I love her as a person. She's too aloof to get attached to. Not that even allow it. She's always pushing other people away. You know? De Quincy grinned. She drooled, is what she did. I've often thought that I would like to crack open her head and see what secrets are nestled inside that skull of hers. No, you shouldn't do that. If you cracked open her head, you'd find nothing but viscera. Rather than satisfying your curiosity, you'd be doing nothing save depriving the world of a great genius. The thought has crossed my mind, yes. I don't think I'd like to become a murderer. Although... De Quincy's playful smile widened further still. I think I'm exactly the kind of person who would commit murder if given the chance. I'm not particularly violent, but I've been known to do some rather foolish things when the urge strikes me, such as running away from school. If somebody annoyed me enough, I might be tempted to take a swing at them with a knife, just to see what would happen. Murder is often regarded as a base act. I believe there may be a kind of art to it, done correctly, with the right mise en scene. Samantha, who had probably come closer to stabbing someone than De Quincey ever had, not that De Quincey knew this, backed away anxiously her supposed acres of cheeks, white and spectral. Are you quite sure you want to confess these grisly inclinations to me right now, in the middle of the night? When we're the only ones around? I am beginning to feel rather uneasy. Oh yes, good point. <laughs> De Quincy giggled and let her second cigarette fall to the ground just as before. She extinguished its remaining life under her heel like a merciless god. Don't worry, Sam. I don't have a knife on me right now. I have nowhere to conceal it. So you're probably good. I wouldn't want to murder anybody with my bare hands either. Now that's finesse. Passion too. Passion? Mm-hmm. De Quincey nodded. There'd be no blood, no gurgling moans, no whimpers of pain, no desperate gasps for air made through pursed lips. It just wouldn't feel satisfying. I don't know if this is making me feel much better. Can you really look at a murder as a matter of aesthetics? Serial killers, yeah. Everything in this world is a matter of aesthetics. I thought you of all people would understand being a poet. But there are some things that shouldn't be spoken lightly. Murder is a serious crime. I know. That's the best part. It's precisely because it's so serious that I want to treat it with the respect it deserves. Murder should be done in a slow, considered manner. Almost bureaucratic, maybe. To wring from its maximum amount of pleasure. Just look at the witch trials. They were cruel, yes. But at least those rotten inquisitors knew how to make a proper narrative out of a murder. Such wanton cruelty deserves to be celebrated in some form. Did Quincy pause, pondering. Perhaps I should write about it at some point. Samantha Brown, she wasn't sure whether De Quincy was being serious in her assertions or not. Maybe De Quincy herself didn't even know. She was a difficult person to comprehend at the best of times. But anyway... De Quincey trilled, smiling brightly. Now that we've ascertained, I didn't, in fact, lure you out here to slip a knife between your ribs, we should return to the original point of our conversation. The original point of the conversation, whatever it was, had become buried under deluge of rambling De Quincey and detour. Samantha was struggling to remember what it was. What were we talking about again? Well, you know, what happened between us? What I did to you, rather. Oh. During their lengthy interlude, Samantha had almost managed to forget that. I just... I don't suppose... well... De Quincey frowned. I don't think I was being entirely honest with you before, 
when I spoke of what I did and why. I was drunk at the time, it is true, but I think part of me, and not a particularly small part either, wished to hurt you. I thought you deserved it, really, after all. De Quincy's expression twisted. I've always been jealous of you. Jealous? Samantha gopped, her eyes comically large in her pale face. Why were you jealous of me? I'm a wreck. De Quincy had held Samantha's hair back or away from her face as she vomited into the toilet bowl enough times to know. Samantha was always drinking, smoking, ingesting things she should not, and then expelling all of it from her system when her body, weakened after all abuse, had faced. But the longer the pressure could not take it anymore. What about her shameful behavior? Samantha wondered was so very worth De Quincey's envy. I'm aware of that, yes. I know you're a wreck. But that only makes things worse. You're barely a functional human being, but Lillian, for whatever reason, still likes you. She must like you, or else she wouldn't have put up with you for so long. No matter how much you frustrate her. De Quincey seemed certain of Lillian and Samantha's relationship, but Samantha herself was less certain. Samantha loved Lillian with every fiber of her being, but she doubted very much that Lillian returned that love she never had. Now Samantha was unsure whether Lillian even liked her. I think you're being too optimistic. I doubt Lillian still has any positive feelings towards me, and if she doesn't. I can hardly blame her for that. I don't have any positive feelings towards myself, either. Samantha spoke honestly, yet De Quincey brushed her confusion aside with a shake of her head and a careless laugh. Oh, don't be silly. You might have fallen out with her, but I'm sure she'll forgive you soon enough. Lily can be cold, but she's always been fond of you. That's because we've known each other for a while. Doesn't mean she doesn't find me annoying, though. I'm very good at frustrating people, even my best friends. I'll say. De Quincey snorted. You annoy me a lot as well, you know? I suppose that's because we share so many negative traits, though. I have no doubt you find me annoying, too. The thought has crossed my mind on occasions. See? De Quincey smiled smug and self-satisfied as though she had managed to solve a complex mathematical quandary. We really are similar, and yet, we are not the same despite our similarities, and Lillian will never regard me as she does you. It's not possible, because you're better than me in almost every regard, even in your pitiful wreckedness. I suppose, that's why I feel so jealous of you. I know I'll never be able to gain Lillian's affections, no matter what I do. She's already devoted too much of herself to you. That's what I was thinking when I decided to hurt you. It was very calculated, regardless of how drunk I was. I meant to make you suffer, but... De Quincey frowned. Though she had stuffed out her cigarettes, their discarded butts lying among the grass like broken fingers, the smell of smoke lingered still, ephemeral like smoke. You've been looking so awful these last few months. It made me worry. I meant to hurt you, but I didn't mean to hurt you that badly. I don't know if I'm to blame for your misery, but if I am, then... I'm sorry, Sam. Really, I am. I don't know how to leave well enough alone. I really am a dummy. I... well... Samantha looked down at the ground. At those crumpled cigarettes. She wondered if Miss Pope would find them tomorrow and get suspicious. Miss Pope had eagle eyes and was not one to be easily duped. I I forgive you, I suppose. I don't like to hold grudges. I'm not good at it. They seem pointless anyway. They make me feel miserable. I don't want to think about what happened between us, so I'd rather forget it. That's one of my talents. I'm much better at ignoring things, at putting them off, than I am at writing poetry. So, you're not mad at me? No. I'm not mad, I'm just... Samantha's expression twisted. Unhappy. That isn't your fault, though. I've been unhappy for such a long time. I doubt any outside intervention 
could change that. Not substantially, at least. The only person who could cheer Samantha when she was submerged in the depths of dejection was Lillian, and Lillian no longer wanted anything to do with her. Without Lillian, what was there to be done? Samantha didn't know. She didn't care. All she wanted to do was disappear, just like the hazy smoke from De Quincey's cigarettes. <laughs> well? De Quincey smiled bashfully. Thank you for your forgiveness, Sam. I'll cherish it. Do what you like with it. It's not much. The thing I do is... You're always hard on yourself. I wish you wouldn't be. I fail to see how my opinion of myself has any relevance to you. I suppose it doesn't, but... De Quincey linked her arms behind her back, then peered at Samantha, her gaze watchful. Despite all the things I said, I do consider myself your friend, even if you no longer wish to be mine. And that's your friend, though a self-appointed one. There's one or two things I feel obliged to tell you. What? Lillian, she? Though she might like you, she doesn't love you. She is incapable of it. Nothing you could do or say to her will ever sway her on this matter. The more you pine after Lillian, the more it'll hurt you. And I don't know how much more this hurt you can cope with. I think you might be close to your limit already. I respect you a lot, despite your numerous flaws and my own jealousy, and I am saying this as one friend to another. If you keep loving her as you are, you'll ruin your relationship. And I know how much she means to you. I can see the longing in your eyes. If you want to be her friend again, a, her proper friend, you need to stop regarding her as an idol. I know this for a fact because I'm forever fawning over Lillian, and you've seen how she treats me. She always tries to avoid me. You don't want her to treat you like she treats me, do you? I can't believe I'm telling you this, but De Quincey bit her lip concerning me before speaking thus. Stop being so needy, Sam. If you can show Lillian you can function without her constant companionship, she'll begin to trust you again. But trust is all you can expect from her. Trust and kindness and affection, yes, but not love. Still, De Quincey smiled. These things are all better than pity, don't you think? I... Samantha averted her eyes, suddenly incapable of looking at De Quincey's face. The other girl's expression was unusually earnest. Her skin illuminated by the light of the moon. The moon was so large and full it appeared as though it might split at any moment, leaking milky tears across the midnight sky. I know you're telling the truth, but... What? Samantha pressed her hands against her chest. Her heart burned horribly as though inflamed with an illness. Samantha knew this to be melodramatic, but she couldn't help but wonder whether this is what it felt like when one's heart was breaking. Perhaps it was already broken. It had been for some time. And now the pieces were being splintered anew by De Quincey's well-meaning words. It ached simply to inhale. Samantha had always found the countryside with its sprawling hills and verdant fields comforting. Now, however, the countryside was cold and dark, distinctly unforgiving, and trees were stripped bare of leaves. The heather, so beautiful under the sunlight, seemed like a thick black sea of tar. Samantha was standing underneath the open sky exposed to the heavens, yet, rather than feeling free and exalted, she instead felt more enclosed than ever before. Perhaps it was the weight of her own morose feelings, pinning her in place to this dull, dreary, mortal world more effectively than any physical chain could. I... I just can't. I'm not a sensible person, you see. You should know this yourself, being just as impulsive as I am. I'm a slave to my own feelings. I can't see beyond them. I can't think rationally. I... Samantha inhaled, her fingers clutching at her chest, as though to tear out her heart. I love Lillian. I love her so much, and I can't stop. I don't know how. I know my life would be easier if I didn't. But I can't make myself not love her. It is impossible. I just want to be with her no matter how hopeless it might be. I want to stay by her side forever. Though she will surely, within time, and perhaps already does, begin to view me as nothing more than a nuisance, a bother, a chore. But I... I can't help myself. I'm such an idiot. Samantha didn't know at what point during her furious string of self-abashing comments she had begun to cry. It didn't particularly matter. 
All she knew was when she finished her tirade, her words lost to the howling wind, her eyes stung, and her cheeks were wet. She had cried numerous times before in Roberta and Lillian's presence, but Samantha had tried not to sob in front of De Quincey. Samantha found De Quincey's slavish devotion towards Lillian even more pathetic than her own, and had, though she did not like to admit it, often considered herself to be superior to her classmate. Samantha realized this was perhaps a touch ridiculous given De Quincey had seen her ashen face and sweating, her cheeks streaked with her own vomit on numerous occasions. But it was true all the same. What little self-respect Samantha had once possessed, however, had deserted her. What use was self-respect now when Lillian no longer cared for her? She didn't need it. She had no use for it. She didn't want anything to save Lillian. Samantha stood there, surrounded by the swaying heather, and sobbed miserably, brokenly, hiccuping every once in a while. She didn't even attempt to brush her tears away. Instead, she held her arms to her side, her head hanging, like a broken doll. De Quincey surveyed her for a while, her eyes wide, unsure of what to do. Left with nothing of work to say, she could utter nothing save thoroughly unnecessary. Sam, are you alright? Samantha didn't respond. There was no words, but she could illuminate her feelings more effectively than tears. Oh, Sam. Agreed, De Quincey shook her head. You're more foolish than I thought. I can't believe Lily ever liked a fool like you. Funny enough. This rebuke did not make Samantha feel better. If anything, it made her cry even harder. If Lillian really has grown tired of you, I can see why. You would try the patience of a saint, and Lillian certainly is not one of those, no matter how much I admire her. Well, we'll end this episode here. We'll see how this ends. I'm assuming the next episode will be the last episode in this series. Alright, if you have a like, comment, subscribe, I am too. Have a wonderful morning, evening, afternoon.